Awesome, awesome. Please turn me to Psalms 84. We're going to hop in it right now as the sun's coming out. I can see some people about to get scorched. <laughs> Psalms 84. You know, this past Wednesday, I got a chance to preach to the brothers. And I thought, you know what, how about I uh, preach this lesson to the sisters as well? So I made sure to, 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 to fine tune it for the sisters this morning. Psalms 84, give me amen when you're there. We've had a great service so far. Uh, thank you to the Mogollons for teaching us how to give back the contribution. But also, thank you for demonstrating how to do salsa dancing right there. You know, one day, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys how to do it as well. But no, pray for me. Psalms 84, verse 1. The Bible says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Does that sound like your quiet time this morning? That you're just longing to be with your creator. It's awesome to be out here in the park and see what God has created. And why did God create all this? It was for our entertainment and our pleasure and enjoyment. Verse 3. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King, my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Are you fired up to be in the house of God this morning? We have an incredible calling of God. He says that when we set our heart on pilgrimage, what does that mean? means we have the greatest, we are on the greatest journey, the greatest adventure to what? To see God face to face. He has given us a purpose where we can go to the Valley of Baca, which means dry desert wasteland, and turn it into a spring of pools. Meaning we could take God's word, the very living water, and go to all nations and satisfy them. And quench their thirst. And there's so many people out there that are looking and are longing to know truth. But who's going to carry the scriptures to a dying world? When I look at this park, I'm like, I look at men and women that have taken on this purpose. But the Bible does say we are all on a pilgrimage, but you got to set your heart on pilgrimage. And the only way we're going to make it to see God face to face, like the scripture just said, you got to go from strength to strength. And the title of this for you this morning is from strength to strength. See, as a disciple, we don't go from weak and getting weaker. No, you got to get stronger as a Christian. When you said Jesus is Lord, how is your walk going? Is your walk with God going, getting stronger or are you starting to drift back? The Bible actually promises when you set your heart... God will actually strengthen you. Yeah, come on, bro. I got two points for us this morning before we see Eva get baptized. I want to help my family this morning and get strong this morning. Now, there's a saying in the summertime where a lot of people want to snooze during the summertime. But for disciples of Jesus, we go from strength to strength in the summertime. But how are we going to do that? How are we stronger? Well, I got two points. Point number one, on, we got to be strengthened by God. Wow. Strengthened by God. It says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Did you guys catch that? God Almighty, he's looking at the whole world. People think that God's absent. 
He's not absent. He's here. He's among us right now. He's in everything. But he's looking, though. So his eyes are ranging throughout the whole earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed to him. So what do we just learn from the scriptures? What comes first, strength or commitment? commitment? So if I don't commit myself to the Lord, I will not get stronger. See, I've heard this saying is that, you know, I need to take a break from the church so I can get stronger. That is a false teaching. Well, why is that? Because the church is the body of Christ. When you're connected to the body, then you're connected to the head, which is Jesus. See, we're all going to get weak in our point in time because God will see where do you run to to get strong. See, a lot of people think becoming a Christian is going to be easy. Sunshine and rainbows. No, no, it's actually be very challenging because God wants to know what is in your heart. Are you only going to worship God through the good times? Or are you going to worship God even during the bad times? Well, why do you think there's a book of Job in the Bible to give us an example on how we must follow? Job was tested. He lost family. His health was declining. He lost his job. But he never cursed God. Yeah, did Job struggle with his pride? Yeah. Did he misunderstand God's sovereignty? Yeah. But God blessed Job's life at the end of his life more than in the beginning of his life. Because he never forsaken God. Yeah. You know, what I love about the scriptures is it's very clear. When we set our hearts on God, God will strengthen you. Yeah. But if we don't go to God, we will not find strength. Mm-hmm. Now, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, I was studying for my quiet time, it was to the king Asa. Yeah. Asa was an incredible king. He set his heart with God and he did extraordinary things. But here's the thing. It's not about how you start with God. It's how you finish with God. King Asa got a little overconfident, and he started relying on his own strength, and that's when he got very weak and he fell. This morning, God is looking to see, how strong are you? Anybody can pretend to be physically strong. Anybody can pretend to be spiritually strong. But how do you know if someone's actually strong? They got to get tested. What test does God have you in right now? You're visiting this morning for the first time. Like, this is interesting. Half this side is no, there's nobody over here. You hear the songs, like, I don't know what they're singing. You hear this guy preaching, I don't know what he's preaching. But hopefully you're taking notes. So you go back over and see, is he actually teaching what the Bible teaches? But my goal, my very objective this morning is, You walk out of here making decisions to strengthen your walk with God. Because at the end of the day, the only thing you get in this life is a relationship with God. If you want something more than God, then you're going to get weaker and weaker in this life. So you're probably asking, well, how do I get strength from God? Let's go look at it. Let's go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40 is one of my favorite passages growing up. My grandpa would say this scripture all the time. I had no idea what it meant. It's pretty easy to like hear it, but like to put it into practice is different. Come on, bro. Strengthened by God. Isaiah 40. Come on, bro. Let's look at verse 28. Come on, bro. It says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. What do we learn about God? is he's everlasting. He's a God that you don't want to mess with. Because why? He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get weary. 
He doesn't give into anxiety. Isn't that someone you want to run to? But how come in the world we're taught to run to other things to find strength? A lot of people want to go on like, you know, a lot of vacations because they'll find renewal. But you come back still tired. You're like, man, I can't. I'm like, I, ah, this, my vacation's almost over. I go back to my work. Well, vacation was really supposed to get you strength. When do you want to come back to work fired up? Like, I'm refreshed. But we're sold lies. If I get more money, and then I can retire when I'm age of 50. That's the goal of Americans, right? It was, it was awesomely said by the Mogollons about we work to retire. And then we enjoy our life after retirement. It's like, is that really what life's all about? God tells us, you will get weak. You will get weary. Because God wants to see where are you going to run to when your circumcised, circumcised, circumcised is bad? We got to look at our circumstances and say, hey, am I going to run to God? Or am I going to run to my comfort or my pleasure? Wow. See, right now, God is looking at where have you been running to? Have you find your strength in God, your walk with God? Is your hope in God? Hope just means desire. It's your number one desire. Wow. If people, if God would look at your life, would he see what is your number one desire? Wow. How you know if what if it gets taken out of your life? Are you still going to be fired up? God wants to know what is your number one desire. But what I love about God is he has, he's faithful to his promises. It says God says he will give strength to the weary. He will increase the power of the weak. He will renew your strength. It does not say you will do this. A lot of us think we can rely on our own strength. But you will burn out very, very quickly. And how many people start with God, but then they fizzle out and they walk away from God? Because they're looking for instant gratification. But God will only give you what you need, not necessarily what you want. Because God's like, if I give you what you want right now, you're actually going to leave me. So many people on this earth, they usually, their greatest desire is, I want a relationship. I want to get married and have kids. That's like, usually I walk around, I ask, hey, what's your, what do you want in life? I want a family and kids. Okay. So that's, that's normal. But when, if God gave it to you right now, would God still be your number one desire? Because why is it God, why do people only go to God when things are bad? Like once God gives you what you ask for, then you forsake God. If you look at the book in 2 Chronicles, King Asa started with God, but he didn't finish with God. And God makes it very clear. When you're with me, I am with you. There's a false teaching out there saying that God is with you when you're not even seeking him. No, God doesn't want, well, he doesn't waste his time with people that don't seek him. And if you forsake him, it's clear God says, I'll forsake you. It's a deep, deep understanding that God's like, hey, I am the person, I'm the one you got to seek to to find strength. And this is something I got to learn throughout my, my life as a disciple. I'm going on being 11 years in the Lord. And I realize this Christianity is, is, is a marathon. It requires endurance. It requires, like, I can't do this on my own strength. I will, I'll fade out. And there's so many examples in the Bible. Where people started with God, but then they didn't finish strong with God. King Asa was a good example. Noah started great with God, but then he didn't finish with God. David started with God, didn't really finish with God. There's so many examples where people, like, start with God, but they don't finish. And that is the greatest challenge for any Christian. Can I be fired up with my relationship with God for my whole life? And this is something I had to learn when I was a young Christian. Because I grew up going to, uh, to churches and I'd see people going to church worshiping God. But then out, outside the building, I look at their life and they're living a double life. I'm like, well, if you're a true Christian, I want nothing to do with your religion. Because they're nothing like Jesus. This other day, I, I, or last week, I was with family, and I'm, I'm learning, like, I, I hear a, a comment from my uncle, and basically learning, like, we're never going to be perfect. 
I'm like, but that doesn't give you the the reason not to strive for perfection. Because Jesus says, be perfect as I'm perfect. Because God looks at the heart. See, we can look at somebody and say, okay, you're strong spiritually. You're strong physically. But maybe inside they're not. Maybe they're just hanging on by a thread. Because God's the one. I'll strengthen your heart. But what does God look for? Commitment. It says in Psalms 18, verse 1, it says, I love you, Lord, my strength. Wow. How did David view his relationship with God? His strength. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Yeah. Second Samuel says, it is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. There should be no such thing as an insecure Christian. What are you insecure about? If you're insecure, it's because you're not walking with God like you should. The Bible says you should be powerful. You should be confident. You should have competence to instruct and show people how to live the life God called you to live. But if you're insecure, you're not allowing God to meet that need in you. Your insecurity, you try to run to other things to find comfort. But it only leads to emptiness. Psalm 73 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And that's why David says, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. This was David's walk with God. He knew who God was. Even when David fell, he understood, like, you know what, you're right. Nothing in this life was more important than my relationship with God. And sometimes God will put you in a situation for you to reflect and renew. What is it all about for you? For me, last week, I got a chance and, uh, to drive up to Washington to see my grandparents. Because uh, my grandpa, he's, uh, he's going blind. And I wanted him to meet his uh, great-grandson for the first time. And as I was driving to Washington, I, I made a little stop in Oregon. That's where my dad, my, my, my dad lives. And I was driving, you know, it was a 15-hour drive with the, the little one. It's a little bit challenging for those who have kids. <laughs> um, but I remember I was driving, and we stopped in Oregon. And I just used that time to really just have self-reflection. What is Tyler's life worth? So a lot of people, they know me. Like, oh, yeah, he's the preacher. He does this. He does that. Like, but I had to take the time. Like, who is Tyler? Wow. What is it all about for me? And sometimes you got to go back home and really see where you come from. And I remember going home, and I used this time to kind of go back down Journey Lane and look where all the houses I used to live. Because when I was little, I, we moved all the time. and never really had a stable place. But I ended up going to the cemetery, because that's where my, my, my grandparents were, were buried, and the ones in Oregon. And I remember going there, and that's where my best friend was buried. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go visit. You know, I need the time to really just kind of have a reflection. And I pull up to the cemetery, and I find my, my best friend's tombstone. And I went there, and I sat there. And I just paused. And I'm like, if my best friend was still alive, what would he think of me? How would he view my life? Would he see a man that's more and more like Jesus? Or did I just become very religious? I had to use reflex. You know, we all here, right? Let's be real. There's no such thing, you know, we don't want to put on a facade. We're family. We expose our weaknesses because when we are weak, we are strong. But if you pretend to be strong, you're always going to be weak. So I stopped there. And then I went to my grandparents' tombstone. And I just sat there and my heart was moving. And I got emotional. I was like, man, I miss my grandparents. I love them so much. They, they did so much for my family. They planted a lot of seeds. And I, just, I asked myself the same question. If my grandparents were alive, how would they view me? Would they be proud of me? Like, man, you're being more and more like Jesus. You're striving every day. Or would they see another religious person? And I had to think and I reflect, what is it all about for me? And I want to ask the same question for you. What is it all about for you? Why do you wake up every single day? What is your purpose for living? What's the meaning of your existence? How are your relationships with one another? Does it reflect your relationship with Jesus? Where you're absent? Never see anybody? You like hide yourself in the room all the time? 
You never, you never initiate. You wait for someone to come to you. Oh, come on, bro. Again, how you walk with people is the same thing you walk with your relationship with God. Yeah. And that's how it's so. That's why I love the Bible. It's so clear. When you look at somebody, you look at the Bible. It should match. Yeah. We're known by our love for one another. How's it going with your relationships with one another? If there's absence, when you feel you're drifting from relationships with people, you got to start with, how's your relationship with God going? Is your hope still to be with God and see him face to face? If he's not your great reward, you are going to live a weak life. You may get what the world promises you, but it will never satisfy you. You know, I'm a man that's married to an incredible, beautiful, spiritual, God-fearing wife. And I got the little man over there that's an awesome and pure joy right there. You know, gives, he gives me a run for my money. Um, but I had to reflect, like, even that is so awesome. It's a gift of God. But there's nothing greater than a walk with God. He gives us everything we need to live a godly life. So you got to ask yourself, well, does God love me less if, I, if I'm not married? No. Is this not your season yet? I want to talk to the singles for a minute. Are you content with your social status? Mark's like, yes. <laughs> Are you content? Because what I found out when someone surrendered to their social status, that's when God can work in your life. But when you're like, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it God's like, dude, I, I don't want to give it to you. Desire to walk with me. Give me your whole heart first. Don't idolize anything. The world teaches us to idolize everything. People are in relationships. They go after doing everything. Relationship, can, you get out of it, and they end up being broken. Why is the divorce rate so high right now? Because God's absent. Mm-hmm. Your marriage is the way it is because your walk with God is the way it is. Wow. Amen. We have to take a good, hard look in the mirror, which is the scriptures. Yeah. And sometimes when you see the reflection, you're like, I don't like this reflection. I want to break the mirror. Or you know what? I'm not going to look at the mirror anymore. And everyone sees you like, dang, man, you need a mirror. You need a change. But nobody likes that word change. No one likes to be called out. And that's why Jesus was killed. Because he called out the religious society saying, you got to repent. you got to hold to my teachings. Because when you hold to traditions, your heart is far. And now you just become a religious hypocrite. Does anybody want to be a religious hypocrite where you feel empty inside, but you're trying to get, you're trying to please people all the time? How exhausting is that? We all were in high school at one point. Did we all want to be liked? We would do anything just to be liked in school. But then you graduate, those friends like disappear. Like, where's all the friends I poured myself out to get liked from? They're gone. So now, you know, now there's social media so you can still keep in track and show them how cool you are on social media. But inside, you're so empty. And you get to a point where you're so weak. The only thing that helps you at night is, let me take some drugs. Let me go after this or that to find satisfaction. But it never cures you. For me, I studied the Bible 11 years ago. And the only cure I found was having a relationship with God. You know, to see Anna Grace come up here and share vulnerably her, her restoration. She saw what was missing. It was God in the kingdom. We gotta be those who are real. We can't be those who put on pretend face and act like everything's okay. If you're not strong, then say it. Get open with where you're at. We're family. We want to help each other get strong. If your marriage is weak, get open about it. If your household's weak, get open about it. If your personal life is weak, get open about it. Because how can a doctor help anybody if they don't get open about what's going on? The Bible is compared to medicine. We got to take it even if it tastes nasty. And sometimes it tastes nasty, but it brings healing. Yeah. And I know when I look out at the crowds, I see people that are hurting. Oh. And you're trying to hide it. Oh. But the Bible says the eye is the lamp of the body. Oh. You go to somebody, look them right in the eye, say, hey, how's it going? It's, 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 it's good. It's good. It's good, I think. Uh, uh, and they walk away. It's not good. Mm. You need medicine. Yeah. You need a relationship with God. 
If you're, if you're coming here for the first time, I want to encourage you, study the Bible. Yeah. Humble yourself to the scriptures. And maybe you went to the church your whole life. Doesn't mean you're a Christian. Mm. Come on, bro. Jesus said, go make disciples, yeah. not church goers. Are you with me? Yeah. I want to challenge us in the month of July to push the reset button. Reflect and renew with God every day this week. Because why? Life is more important with God. Don't try to do life without God. You're only going to burn out and then you're going to probably blame God for your own foolish decisions. Because God created you for a reason. He created you for purpose. And let's look at that purpose. Let's go to Acts 9. Point number two is you got to be strengthened by the mission. Strengthened by the mission. Yes, you got to get your strength from God, but there's a reason why he strengthens you so you can do his mission. You're bought with a price. And that price is your whole life. And when you give yourself fully to the Lord, there's some work to be done now. Because are we satisfied with what we see on the news? No. But are we going to be the ones that bring a solution or just going to keep seeing the problems? Yeah. And then if you're a family, you gossip about all the problems. Did you see that debate about the presidents? Oh. I think we all saw that through social media. The solution is sold out disciples. Yeah. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, it says, Tyler. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have many, I've heard many reports about this man, all the harm he has done in your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you're coming here, has sent me so you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised Habak in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow. What an incredible conversion story yeah. of Paul. Wow. What was Paul doing before he became a Christian? Yeah. He was murdering them. Amen. He was so zealous about his mission. And Jesus is like, that's the wrong mission, buddy. And Jesus comes down and has a Bible study with Saul which is his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Roman name. And he looks at him and says, why do you persecute me? And I love his response. Says, well, well, who are you, Lord? He understands this, this was someone bigger than himself. He thought his mission was great, but Jesus' mission is even greater. 
It says, and but Jesus saw something in Paul, even though he was killing Christians. I'm like, why did Jesus choose a murderer? Well, here's the thing. Aren't we all murderers? Yeah. Haven't we all sinned? And what did our sin do to Jesus? It killed him. Yeah. So we're all equal in the eyes of God. But he understands those who are forgiven little loves little. Who is forgiven much loves much. Yeah. I think that that's why God chose Paul. Yeah. Very zealous, very ignorant, however. But he intervenes in his life and he says, hey, you know what you got to do. There's a guy that you're going to meet named Ananias. He's a disciple. He will tell you everything you must do. I love this scene because he's having an encounter with Jesus and Jesus leaves. This guy's not even saved yet. He still has to go meet a disciple named Ananias. And it's crazy because Ananias was a little, a little coward. He's like, uh, no, Jesus, you know, this guy is, uh, he's uh, killing us. <laughs> but God's like, don't be a coward. I'm going to give you strength to fulfill what I'm asking you to. But this guy who's killing Christians, he's got to learn how much he must suffer now. So then Ananias does the race. Like, all right, I guess if I, if I die, I die, I guess. So Ananias sees Paul. And what does Ananias do? He tells him, you're the chosen instrument to proclaim to the Gentiles. And then what happens? He gets baptized. He eats some food, amen. And he regains his strength. But did you see what he did right after he got baptized? He spent several days with the disciples. And at once, he started preaching God's word. Well, think about it. When you got baptized, weren't you so excited that you knew the truth that you just couldn't wait to share it? Do you still have that passion? Do you still have that heart? Do you still have that urgency to seek and save the lost? Because what I learned here is, Paul started beginning to preach, but he didn't stop. It says he kept preaching and became more and more powerful because he baffled the Jews living there. Are you baffling people with the knowledge of the, of the truth? Or are you being silent? See, I believe a lot of disciples have a bad understanding of the mission. We thought we'd go out there and make disciples. That's true. But you do because you love God, not the response. See, Paul didn't get a lot of good responses. He played dodgeball with rocks, and he lost a lot of times. But did it stop him from preaching God's word? No, he didn't preach for likes. He preached to get the word in their heart because that's the only way you find strength. For us in the South Bay, are we continuing to hold on to the greatest mission of all time and seeking and saving the lost? Mark 1 says Jesus came to earth for one reason, was to preach the word. Yeah. Luke 18 says, I came to seek and save the lost. If that was Jesus' purpose, that's the apostles' purpose, how much the disciples in the 21st century are we about our father's business? On, when I look at the South Bay, I see an incredible revival. I see a revolution. Especially I see... In the beginning of the year in San Jose, we had 61 disciples. And after today, we're going to be at 98 disciples. Why? Because we're sticking to the mission. Already this year, we're going to see our 36th baptism. Last year alone, we saw 35 in San Jose. But God's like, no, even greater things in the year of blessings. But it's going to take a man... It'll take a woman that keeps her heart soft and sticks to the right mission. See, when you're sticking to the right mission, you will be strengthened. See, I love being Bible studies. It's the greatest thing, honestly, is laying down God's word and seeing the individual respond. And you can see the light go in their eyes. Instead of saying, oh, I'm good. Now, like, no, I'm great because I know God. That is why we have, that's why God gave us a purpose. Your meaning of life is to take God's word yeah. to the nations. I love seeing what the family is doing here in the South Bay. I love what God is doing through the disciples. You know, earlier this year, you know, Say, our awesome sister. She's like, you know what? She's like, I got to be a part of God's mission. So she gets evangelistic and she baptizes her stepmom, Sabrina. And I got the awesome privilege with Rich and the guys. We're studying the Bible with her dad now, James, who, Lord willing, will be getting baptized very, very soon.
But then I thought about it, and now he already knows, you know. But I also think about our dear brother, Sean. Sean, he's like, I got to be about my father's business. And of course, I got to share with my awesome brother. And then his brother gets baptized. And Jake, man, he is fired up for his salvation. Even when I got he's already asked me questions. He's trying to get stronger. And I know this next ha- second part of the half of the year, he's going to get even more powerful because you know what you got to do, bro? You're going to be preaching God's word. But then I'm also excited because we had an incredible, incredible young man named Anthony. And Anthony, you know, he had some cost to count. You know, he's wrestling with the scriptures. But then he saw Jesus face to face through the Bible. He's like, there's nowhere I'd rather be than being with God. He gives up everything. He makes Jesus Lord and he gets baptized. But he's like, no, I got to stick to the mission. And what does he do? He shares his faith was his sister, Eva, who's getting baptized in a moment. (laughs) Families are getting strengthened in Christ. Why? Because people have the the courage to set their heart on pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is an awesome journey with God. We get to go to work with God every single day. Who knows who you're going to impact today? When you leave here, I want to challenge you. Share your faith. There's people longing for this. They're longing for purpose. They're longing for family. They're looking for peace. They're looking for love, but they're looking for strength. And it's only found through a sold out disciple who preaches God's word. I want to challenge us. Let's be like the fireworks in the month of July and have explosive months. Let's share our faith daily and let's see what God does in the month of July. Let's close in Hebrews chapter six. Let me encourage you guys this morning. Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews 6 and verse 9. Give me amen when you're there. Amen. amen, bro. It says in Hebrews 6 verse 9, Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people. And continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. So that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy. But to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. When God made his promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater for him to swear by. He swore by himself saying I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. This morning, we serve a God who is faithful. We serve a God who's faithful to his promises. We serve a God who is not unjust. We serve a God who does not forget your work. All the things you do for God, he does not forget. All the love you shared among the disciples, he does not forget. All the times you went tagging. All the time with the error mark. Every time you share your faith, God does not forget. The challenge is, is to continue to be diligent to the very end. Have a passion for God's work. Don't slow down. Don't look for instant results. God knows what you need. But you got to remain steadfast. Because God is faithful to his promises. He knows exactly what you need. Like it says in Jeremiah 29, God knows all the plans. Plans that prosper you and not to forsake you. Our job is to hold on to those promises. Is to remain faithful in the month of July. Because July right now, Satan is also scheming. He wants to give you one of his promises. Don't fall for the lie. Imitate those who are making Jesus Lord of life. Eva's, Eva's buying into that, that promise right now. That God has better plans than we have for ourselves. God wants to bless our labor with many more souls getting saved. Family, let's keep our hope in God because that is where we find true strength. Let's continue to become more powerful through the mission of preaching. And let's go from strength to strength and to God be all the glory.